So I thought about making introduction tutorials for C++, Swift, Python and JavaScript or Go. And I was looking into that and I figured that it's quite a lot of work. All this cutting and filming, input, output, variables, control structures, loops, maybe functions and classes, exploring the standard library and that for every language, no way. But then I had an idea. Every tutorial is the same. Why not just make one video for five languages? Today we will look into five different concepts of programming in five programming languages. I will skip installing any IDE or compiler for the programming languages. There is documentation for your operating system on the internet. This stuff changes anyway and is boring as f I will put some links down in the description below if you need help googling yourself. Lazy bastards. All right, fasten your seatbelts, get yourself a coffee or any stimulant of your choice. Here we go. Output. The first thing to figure out in a programming language is how to put stuff on the screen. Python. Print hello world. This is the most vanilla hello world program you will get. Let's run it. Works. Next. Swift. Print hello world. Like Python. Let's go on with JavaScript. Console log hello world. Print simply become console log. C++. This is the most esoteric way of putting something on the screen that we will encounter today. The two little arrows are called stream operator. Basically what comes behind it streams out on the screen. End L is end of line and basically just inserts a line break at the end of this output. And before I get mean comments, I know that runnable C++ must look like this. I will put a lot of code on the screen now. And for the flow of this video and for readability, I will leave some stuff like imports and the main function out but I will link everything in the description below. So you can check out the code later on your own pace. Off to the last one, go. Print ln or print line hello world. The FMT in front of print ln defines the module this command is coming from. A module is a group of commands that are made for one purpose. FMT stands for format and the print ln command comes from the format module because it prints formatted text onto the screen. Every programming language has something like modules to group functionalities. The content of each one is something you learn while using the programming language. Don't stress about it. After we put some characters out on the screen, let's read some characters in as well. Input. Python. This is pretty similar to our output example, but this time the program also asks you for your name before it greets you. It waits for you to enter one line of input and greets you with your name. The thing in front of the equal sign is called a variable. It can store different things. Its content is variable, hence the name. Our program uses it to remember your entered name. For the next statement, which greets you. This one looks a little funky, but all that is happening is that the percent %s is replaced with the content of the variable name. The percent %thingy is a placeholder for a string. A string is a string of characters. In other words, a string is text. String is a data type because it describes the type of data we are talking about. If we look at the JavaScript version now, it looks quite similar to the Python version, but there are two differences. First, we have a new word here. Const means that the value inside of the variable can't change after it was first set, which makes it a constant. And second, there is no percent %s. JavaScript uses dollar sign curly brackets to get the name into the string. This is called string interpolation and it is something I google first when I start learning a new programming language. In some languages, variables have data types. So just one type of data could be stored in a variable. In JavaScript and Python, this is not the case. You could store everything in the variable name. Not so in C++, Swift or Go. Those are strongly typed languages, which means every variable needs to have a data type. In C++ and Go, you see variable declarations that define the data type of this variable to be string. A declaration is nothing more than a fancy way of saying here is something. Here is a variable with the name variable and the type string. In Swift we don't write string. The programming language is intelligent. The compiler knows that read line is returning a string. So the variable type of name must be string as well. Other than that you just see three different ways of printing hello and your name after it which is pretty self-explanatory as soon as you see the program running. Next, conditions. Conditions are fundamental building blocks of programs. With conditions you can decide which route a program should take based on a boolean value. Boolean is another kind of data type. It can just have two values, true 
or false. It is, by the way, named after the English mathematician George Boole. If a value is true, the program will go down route A. And if it's false, it will just go down the other way. Let's start with JavaScript this time. We ask a question again and we store the answer in answer. After that, we look if the value inside of answer is yes. If so, we print this. Otherwise, we print that. By the way, the backslash n is a so-called escape sequence, which is telling the output to add a new line here. Answer equal equal yes is a Boolean expression. It is true if answer has indeed the value yes, and it is false for all the other values. If looks at the value of a Boolean expression, if it is true, the first block is executed. If it is false, the else block is executed. But not every if needs an else block. This concept is the same for all our programming languages here. The only thing that is changing is when we use brackets or other kind of symbols. A block in JavaScript is everything that is between these curly brackets. And C++ is pretty much identical when it comes to if conditions as well as go and swim, but without the brackets around the Boolean expression. The only language that takes a different approach to define blocks is Python. In Python, blocks are defined by indention and a preceding colon. Indention is to the number of spaces and tabs before you start your line of code. Let's see what this program looks like in action. If you know the movie this example was inspired by, let me know in the comments below. Next up, loops. What is a loop? A loop is a code block that is executed over and over. There are different kind of loops. There are while loops loops that are executed as long as a boolean expression is true and there are for loops which are executed for a number of elements. There's also this do while loop and this is details, we don't have time for that now. Let's start with Swift. This program is a little bit bigger, let's go through it from top to bottom. We are programming a little game where you have 10 tries to guess a number between 1 and 100. So the first thing our program needs to do is to choose a number between 1 and 100. We store this value in a constant named solution. In Swift, constants are defined using the keyword let. And here's our first loop for i in 1 to 10. Execute this block, which basically means the block is executed for each element between 1 and 10 and i is getting the value of the current loop execution. So for the first execution of the block, i has the value 1. And after that, 2, and so on, until i has the value 10 for the last and final execution of the block. Each loop we ask the player for a guess. If the guess is smaller than the solution, that's what the left facing arrow is for, we tell the user that the solution is bigger. If the guess is bigger than the solution, we tell him the opposite. If none of it is true, we enter the else block and know that the solution is equal to the guess. We congratulate the player and exit the program. If the loop has executed all 10 tries and the program has not exited yet. We know the player has not guessed the correct value yet. So we exit the program again, but this time with an exit code 1. Why that? The exit code of a program signals the operating system if the program execution was a success or a failure. And in case that the player hasn't guessed the number correctly, we exit with a non-zero exit code, which means error. Loops and especially for loops are a little differently written in each programming language. The closest to Swift in this case is Python. Of course, Python doesn't use curly brackets to define the blocks, but a colon and indention. We see the range again, which goes from zero to nine instead of one to 10 this time. So all we have to do is to add a one here. And there's another placeholder, percent %d, which is for numbers without decimal places, so-called integers. Other than that, there's nothing special to note going from Swift to Python. Let's have a look at C++, JavaScript and Go. They all have a different but common way of defining a for loop. In those languages, a for loop declaration is made up of three parts. Initialization of a counter variable, a Boolean expression that has to be true for each execution of the loop and a counter increment. We initialize our counter variable i with one and execute the loop as long as i is smaller or equal to 10. After each loop, we increment our counter variable i with one 
That's what the double plus is for. This way we count from 1 to 10. The rest is basically the same as it is in Swift and Python. There's also some code for the random number generation, but this is really language specific code. I leave it to you to look it up in the documentation if it tickles your pickle. Like I told you in the introduction to this section, there is a second loop that gets executed as long as a Boolean expression is true, the while loop. While this is true, loop this block. In C++, Swift, JavaScript and Python, we use the while keyword to define a while loop. Only in Go, they decided to use the for keyword for the while loop as well. We extend our game with a little prompt at the end. Do you want to play another round? The game loops now as long as or while the variable running is set to true. After each round, we ask the user if he wants to play again and check if he answered yes. So if continue game equals yes, the boolean expression is true, we store that in the variable running and the while loop continues. If the user enters anything else, running will become false and the while loop stops. Which leads to the end of the program. Our program has become pretty lengthy by now, but if you look at it, you can distinguish different parts. First of all, we are asking the user for input, which is always printing a line followed by reading a line. Inside of our main loop, we generate a solution for the player to guess. After that, we have our game loop. In order for the failure message after 10 tries only to appear when the user did not correctly guess the number, we introduce a variable correct, a so-called flag, which we set when the user guesses correctly. And in that case, don't show the failure message. And last but not least, we ask the user if he wants to continue playing, which is in itself another part of the program. Having this parts and this pile of garbage code, let's introduce our final concept for this video, functions. If you're wondering where the code for the while loop in the other languages is, I will link it in the description below. Functions are a way to structure your code into reusable chunks. This way your code will be more concise, easier to read and therefore better to maintain. The acronym DRY stands for don't repeat yourself and basically says that every piece of knowledge in your system should have one place to be found and changed. This principle has been formulated by Andy Hunt and Dave Thomas in their book The Pragmatic Programmer. A link is in the description below. If we want to change how we ask the user something, maybe adding an emoji at the start of the line, we have to do it in multiple places. To fix that, we could introduce a function prompt, which has the task to ask the user something and collect the answer afterwards. The function has a signature. A signature defines the name of the function, what kind of info it needs to work and what it will return after it's done, in case it returns anything. A lot of times you will hear people talk about procedures, which are basically functions without a return value. Or methods, which are functions inside of a class or an object. It doesn't matter. They are all code that can be reused in different places of your program. That's it. So let's build our own function. We call this function prompt and it will take the question we want to ask as the input parameter and will return the answer the user gives as its return value. Since C++ is a strongly typed language, we have to define the data types of the parameters that are coming into a function and the data type of the return value that the function gives to the rest of the program. And the content of this function is basically the code from our main function. Voila, our first function. We can now inject this function everywhere we want to ask the user for something. That looks cleaner already. Another way to use functions is to give code blocks a name and that way make your code easier to read. Functions are a great way to use your programming language to add context to the code that you've written. A much better way, in my opinion, than to use code commons. And don't let anybody tell you that the overhead a function call creates will slow your program down if you use too many functions. That's a rumor that gets tossed around between beginners all the time. Before you optimize your program for speed, optimize it for readability. Program code is many more times read 
then it's written. Generate solution returns the solution the player has to guess. It is a cryptic method and by extracting it to its own function, it's way more readable. The same goes for prompt rematch. It is asking the player if he wants to play again. All the asking and the evaluation of the answer is now stored in one single function. Another way to use a function is to create context for the current state of the program. I know this sounds vague, but let me give you an example. We declare a function for our game loop, play game with solution, and we hand in the solution for the game as the first input parameter. By the way, functions can have more than one input parameter. It is just not necessary for these examples. And return a boolean value whether or not the player has guessed the number correctly. Now we can simplify our code and get rid of the flag inside of the function and outside of the function as well. If not, play game with solution solution, then execute this block. Which basically means if the player did not guess the correct number in this game, we will print this message. And we can simplify it even more. There is no need to store the solution in a variable just to hand it over to our play game with solution function. We can just call generate solution inside of the brackets. This way the return value of generate solution is handed over to the input parameter of play game with solution. Now that's what I call a readable piece of code. I did the refactorings in all the other languages as well. Refactoring is a fancy term to say I changed a lot of code without changing its input and output just to make it more readable. And the main functions look damn similar right now. Sure, there are differences in syntax. Python doesn't use the curly bracket and has like JavaScript untyped parameters and return values. Sometimes you write the return value in front of a function Sometimes you write it behind a function. The main point I'm trying to make with this video is that switching from one language to another is nothing more than just learning the little differences between the syntax of the languages. The concepts are the same. Some of you may say that it's not true for the more advanced stuff that you find in libraries or frameworks. And that is true to some extent. But to create an HTTP request takes the same input and generates the same output in every programming language and with every library. Sometimes it looks a little bit different, but the concepts and the problems are the same. Working with dates, time and time zones is hard in every language. And it doesn't matter if you're working on apps or websites. You will always have something like a view or a model and you will have code that orchestrates data flowing from one to the other. A lot of time you're not just learning a new framework, but also new ways of programming and concepts. Libraries for reactive programming are available for JavaScript, C++ and Swift. All of this is not part of the programming language. But sure, some languages have better libraries or are better equipped to express certain ideas. And that's exactly why it's so important to learn a new language fast. Don't waste time deciding which language to learn first. You won't be locked in. And if you find that there is a better language to accomplish your goal, learn it. I hope you found some value in this video and if you did, please do me the favor and subscribe to this channel now and hit the notification bell. The code for all the examples is linked below. I see you next time. Wow. Wow. Wow.